Some of you may not know him, but uh, he was a very famous, non-believing philosopher who uh, lived in the last century. Uh, he was, while I was growing up, probably the prominent philosopher in the uh, Western world, if not in the whole world. And anyway, he, he was uh, quite an intellect. He got the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1950. And uh, one of the books he wrote was Why I Am Not a Christian. And I won't go into his arguments, but one day somebody asked him, I think during an interview, what he would say to God if he found himself standing before God. Okay? You think about that. If you find yourself standing before God, you're going to have something more to say than, ah. Uh, okay? So they asked him this, and you know what his answer was? He says, I would reproach him for not giving us enough evidence. And what he's saying is, God, here you are. I didn't expect this. I didn't believe in you. But here you are, and it's your fault that you didn't convince me. You didn't provide enough evidence. Uh, well, that's Bertrand Russell's approach. John the Apostle would disagree. Uh, he is in his gospel and in 1 John saying, you know what? The evidence is there. I was an eyewitness. He says this in the first chapter of John. He says this at the very beginning of 1 John. And so he would disagree. And today, he comes back in today's passage to this question of evidence. And it's a very important one, and it opens up a lot of our thinking. Let me just give you a summary, because this is considered by many scholars one of the most difficult passages in the New Testament, if not the Bible. And when you read it, you might say, huh, all right? So let me just kind of give you a preview summary. What it says in this passage it gives us the credentials of Christianity that is based on actual testimony. Don't want to knock this over. Um, it's based on the testimony of history. That Christianity is based on reality. The reality of Jesus' actual birth and Jesus' actual death. And this is the external witness that history provides. But he says there's also not only an external witness, there is an internal witness. Okay? And uh, he's talking about the necessity of this internal witness that when these come together, we receive spiritual understanding that leads to true salvation. So you got that? External witness, internal witness, coming together to give us salvation. There, I've done it as a song, all right? I've done hand motions and everything. Uh, so this is the summary of it, and he calls this salvation, this new life, life in Christ. And this is just not another throwaway term, but it carries a whole lot of significance that doesn't get talked about enough. And the most important thing I hope you get from this uh, message this morning is that true salvation is of the Lord. It is of God. It's not man-made. <clears throat> from the time we get it to the life that we live because of it, it is by the work of God. Okay, so that's where we are, and uh, I find myself, oh, so prayer request for me. I, I have start, I've been using my new inhaler for about six, seven months now, 
and the steroids are starting to accumulate, and you can see it's affecting my voice again. So we may have to switch to something else. I've cut back to half of my dosages, not because I'm Chinese. You know, we Chinese, we like to do that. Doctor says take 12 pills and we take six, save the money. Uh, anyway, um, but it's not because I'm Chinese, but I'm trying to find the right balance between being able to speak and being able to exercise. So anyway, uh, now the question is this, how did you come to become a believer, a Christian? Was it just a human decision or was it by divine intervention? Big, big, important question. When you came to faith, and I hope I said when you came to believe in Jesus, I didn't say when you came to believe in Christianity because there's a huge difference between the two. Believing in Jesus, salvation. Believing in Christianity, religion. Good religion, but only a religion. Okay? And so, that's the issue. Believing in Jesus Christ because of divine intervention. Here's an example of divine intervention. So there is this man named Saul. And he's riding some sort of mount. I don't remember what it was. And he's on his way to find more Christians to persecute. And what happens? Divine intervention. God comes to him and knocks him off his mount, blinds him, and starts to talk to him. And basically, the part that's saved for us God is always very interesting in what he reveals. He says, Paul, what are you doing? What are you up to? Why are you struggling against this? What you're doing to them, you're doing to me. And God is saying, I'm taking this very personally, Paul. Wow, he didn't expect this. See, Paul was trained in the Ivy Leagues, of Jewish society. And he was a top-notch blue blood Jew. He had a list of credentials so long. And so humanly speaking, he had figured his life out. He had figured out his system, Judaism. And he had it down locked tight so that when he says, let me go and be the arm of persecution against the, these new infidels called Christians, the Jewish authorities gave it to him. But what happened is, bam, he meets God. And he's blinded. And he hears him. And he realizes he's wrong. That everything he's thought about with all of his credentials, all of his friends, all of his great teachers, it's wrong. You know, I don't care how smart you are, when you bump up against reality, listen to reality, right? A lot of times we won't do that. And so, as he comes to this point, he says, what do I do? <laughs> and God, it's kind of interesting, he doesn't open up his eyes. His eyes are already open. He realizes he's wrong. But he leaves it blind. And he says to him, I want you to go into town. And there's this guy named Ananias. And he's nobody. He's just a Joe Schmo schmuck. He's going to come and he's going to put his hands on you. And at that point, you're going to see again. <laughs> Is he a doctor? No. Does he have the ability to do miracles? No. Um, does he have friends in high places? No. Why am I going to be helped by this guy? But Paul's left for one thing, faith. He's got to trust and he's got to obey. 
And so he goes in there, and God drags in Ananias, kicking and screaming, because Ananias figures that's the end of his life as soon as he comes into the presence of Saul, because we heard about this guy, and we know what he does to us. So he goes to him, and sure enough, touches him, his eyes are open. And at that point, Paul goes back, and he rethinks everything that he's thought. And who is the driving force in all of this? Is it Paul? Is it Ananias? It's nobody else but God himself. God is the one who directs. God is the one who calls. God is the one who chooses. God is the one who opens eyes. We participate but it's God all the way. And so, you know, sometimes we think of salvation not for what it really is, a supernatural work. We get too intellectual. We get too much into our Western way of thinking about credentials and learning and books. And yet it was faith and it was God Because even good men, great men, they're fallible, and we don't want to put our trust in those things. So how did you come to know? Is yours because you liked Christianity, or you got close to some Christians, or you grew up in a Christian home? You know, there's a lot of ways that you can enter into church and Christianity and never have that intervention from God that gives you supernaturally new life. And John was needing to explain all of this because they had lost people from their fellowship. And people are wondering, well, what happened? And so he's explaining. And we're going to, along the way, learn some very, very important truths. So let's turn to 1 John 5, verses 6 to 12. 1 John 5, 6 to 12, and I'm going to read the first section, and you're going to get some huh here, okay? Um, I'll just use what's up there. This is he who came by water and blood, meaning Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. Next verse. For there are three that testifies. Next. The Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning whom? His son. One more verse. Whoever believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, meaning God a liar, because he has not believed in God's testimony that he has borne concerning his son. All right, so what is he saying? There's various, we go back to verse 6. There's various interpretations for what the water and the blood stands for. Uh, Frankie, let's go back to verse 6. Okay, Um, and, and here's the one that I have chosen, I think fits best with what was happening in John's congregation, and therefore is the best way to interpret it, okay? Because he was writing to them. He wasn't writing to us. So if they don't get it, then it doesn't work. So everything that is written has got to be sensible to the original recipients. So you can't say anybody can interpret it any old way. We have guiding factors. And so basically what happened was this. The Gnostics had come into the church and they were saying, God did not become man. He was not born as a man. 
God did not do it until Jesus, the human, was being baptized. And when the dove came down, that's when God came down and, you know, he possessed him or something like that. But before Jesus, the man, died, God left him because that wouldn't be a good thing for God to die. And so what John is writing, and he's saying, no. God, the Son of God, deity, Christ, was born as a man. Amniotic fluid, water. And then he actually died, and he died in that tragedy, and so there's the blood. So we have those witnesses of history that God actually became man for an entire lifetime. He actually went through the birth process and he actually went through the death process. And you think about that, if God was not God-man in Jesus Christ on the cross, his death could not cover all of our sins. Just the sin of one person. He didn't need it, so who does he cover? The thief on the cross? I don't know. See? So he's saying, this is what you have to realize, that Jesus is real and Christianity is historical. And this is the thing that separates Christianity from every other religious belief system. That it didn't just come out of some smart guy's mind or a claim that he got a vision. Okay? And uh, some of these may be good. But the thing that makes Christianity different is Jesus died for our sins, the God-man, and then he was resurrected. And Paul says if there is no resurrection in history, then we don't know if we're going to be resurrected either. You see? And so you don't find this historical grounding in any other belief system. And so this is first what he says. But he says... That historical witness of birth and death is the external. But there is an internal witness, and it is God, the Holy Spirit, who comes and speaks to us. And it's only when he speaks to us that the spiritual light bulb in us gets turned on. You see? Why people can be professors of religion and Bible, and still not be saved. Because it was all intellect, and the Spirit had not come in and turned on the bulb. And so, that's what he's saying, and we have all of this witness, and so we've got to listen to God, the witness. This is no myth. Jesus actually existed. Remember the song we sang earlier? Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. That's what we're talking about. Opening the eyes of our heart. Not the eyes of our mind, but the eyes of our heart. That it's something beyond mere intellectual understanding and reasoning that, you know, as Paul said to the very intellectual Ephesian church, he says, here's how I'm praying for you. And I'm just going to read it to you. I'll give you the reference in a moment. I'm praying that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope which, to, to which he has called you. And you may know the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. And you might know the incomparably great power that is available to us who believe. See, these are realities, but we don't get it. So we have to have our spiritual eyes opened for salvation, but also for spiritual growth. Um, and so he prays this, and this is a constant theme in the Bible. We're going to have to skip some of the verses that I was going to give you but, uh, you know, Christianity has a lot of things that are very, very much opposite of what you learn in the world. 
We sang the song, I want to come and die so that I may truly, what? Live. Is that contradictory? No. It's kind of hard to get, you see? And so we need the Holy Spirit to help us to get it, and not just intellectually, but get it to the point where it becomes con um, conviction in us. Paul wrote in his letter to the Corinthians, also a very intellectual and uh, cosmopolitan group of Christians, he says, the natural person, meaning the unsaved person, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they must be spiritually discerned. And then in that same passage, he says, when I came to you, I didn't want to use rhetoric. I didn't want to use the tricks of the trade to persuade your logic to accept what I'm saying. He says, I came to you in weakness and in fear and in trembling. So if I'm going to do that, I should be preaching from down here so I can hide from you in weakness and fear and trembling. He's saying, you know what? My rhetoric isn't much. In fact, some of you have criticized it. But you know what? I'm not relying on the rhetoric. He says in the next verse, my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom in men, but in the power of God. When God has a grip on you spiritually, then intellectual arguments cannot pull you out of his grip. And that's what's going on here. And so people misunderstand what faith is about. And so he says, we have these two witnesses and we have to trust God. Then we come to the second half um, of this passage, which only in the last two verses, 11 and 12. And he says, and you know, this faith, what does it get us? Let's look at 11 and 12. And this is the testimony. This is what the historical evidence and witness and the spirit moving in our hearts, this is what it tries to get us to see that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Next verse. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. You see, I was talking last week about how we sometimes think that it's like an object we can purchase, salvation. If I come to church, I can make a purchase. If I say a prayer, I can make a purchase. If I am real good for seven days in a row without messing up, I can make a purchase. It's not something independent that we possess. It's a relationship. Where God comes and he becomes our partner. And he helps us to live out a new life. And guess what? God is the major partner. So he brings his wisdom his discernment, his power, and everything, and he works us with us. And he's not like an overbearing parent. He lets us go as much as we are willing to try. And he's there. And if we're smart, we turn to the major partner. And, you know, we should be grateful because the major partner will allow us to mess up so that we can learn and so we can become wise and we can change. But it's a total partnership relationship of Jesus within through the Holy Spirit. And so he does these great things for us. See, we think of eternal life through a little pinhole. We think of eternal life as what? Live forever. Well, let me disabuse all of us of that, all right? 
There's a Greek story about a person who has favor with the Greek gods. And they says, come, tell us what you want, and we'll grant you a wish. So she goes to the Greek gods, and she says, I want to live forever. They says, done, it's yours. And you know what? She lives forever. But she found that she was growing older and older and older and older ad infinitum. She goes back to them and says, what? She says, what, what? You forgot to ask to stay young forever too. <laughs> What's the moral of this story? Don't get old. <laughs> no, no, never trust a Greek god. <laughs> no, no. But you see, it's more than time. And eternal life is about power. It's about vitality. It is about indestructibility. It is about a whole new value system that lives life from the inside so that you're happy even when you don't have all the stuff your neighbors and your social media and your magazines and your advertisements say you should have because you're serene from within, because the power of God is at work in you. And that is true freedom. And that is true life. And so he comes and he says, you will have this life, and it will be life that is in the Son. And this is what's always been hard to figure out. How do you have the Son to have life? Well, like I said, he comes and he's your partner. Here, John is saying life in Christ. He's thinking back to the last lessons that Jesus taught him. When Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Okay? Uh, most of us never have a vine that grows big enough so that you see more than little leaves coming out. But if you let it grow, branches will actually come out. Okay, um, and, and, and eventually you will bear fruit. That's the kind of togetherness and reliance that we need to have on Jesus Christ. Okay, um, and, and the word for abide in the American use that best captures it is this phrase. You ready for it? Are you a law-abiding citizen? Well, most of the time. But I skate the edges. Sometimes I go past the speed limit. Sometimes I, don't, you know. A real law-abiding citizen keeps not only the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law, right? He knows the law, and it's his gladness to fulfill it. We abide in Christ, in God, basically, by knowing his word and his will. And we stay within it. And so we're receiving from him the instruction that our senior partner can give to us and the help of the Holy Spirit that he dares to give to us because we are abiding by what he says is not only the rules, but the wisdom of living. And we abide not only by reading, but we abide, we achieve that closeness by praying. You see, we tell you to do these things, but sometimes we don't give you a clear enough reason why. You think my wife and I feel closer when we talk to each other? When we're not arguing? <laughs> sure we do. Right? You guys, remember when you first started dating and you go out and have coffee and you could talk for three hours? Now, don't tell me you can't talk. Okay? It's just that after marriage, we forget how. But we were able to do it. And you drew close because you were abiding in each other and with each other. And the promises that you made on your wedding day you abide by the rules that you have set up for your relationship. 
and you know what her wishes and her desires are, right? I told you a few weeks ago, my wife loves chili relleno, and the first thing I do when I get into a New Mexican place is check out the chili relleno, because I want to please her. I want to fight good chili relleno. I leave out the carnitas and the carne asada, and especially the chorizo. You see, we're still abiding, even when we're apart. You get the idea of this abiding? We don't have to get too literal. Like somehow, you got to be attached to Jesus, okay? Like a sucking fish to a bigger fish, or a branch to a vine. But we can as humans given the capacity to abide, to live in the spirit of what God has said and to speak to him and to continue a fellowship with him. I do a lot of funerals. Been crazy this year. I've already done eight funerals. Uh, One thing I've learned, it's true that even though the person is dead and gone, if that person matters to you, their life and their lessons live on. And as I get older, I become wiser. And I remember and I understand, perhaps for the first time, perhaps against what I used to believe, why they say what they say. You see? You can continue to have that relationship. So, it's not impossible because Jesus is right here, isn't right here. We have the Spirit and we can abide in Him and we can have that life. The worst thing you can do is to put your hope in a man. I don't care how smart, how many theological books how soaring his rhetoric or anything else. And even worse is if you, well, equally worse, is if you put your faith in intellect and natural ways. Because Christianity, real life in God, is a supernatural thing, a spiritual thing. So you don't fall into what happens over and over. And John was trying to keep the rest of his church from saying, oh, they've left. They left with the Gnostics, fifth biggest church in America, over in the Chicago area. Right now, the pastor is under fire. The guy who built it for things that they said he did, you know, the people who have put their faith in that pastor, their faith is going to be hurt or their faith could be ruined. So man can disappoint. But God, Jesus, the Spirit, he does not. And that's why I'm working real hard to have you put a big wall of separation between intellect and spirit, between man and God. Yes, We have the evidences. Yes, we have the historical grounding. This is no myth. But we need the spirit to work in our hearts. And then after that, we experience the life by abiding. And so, when you come to your time of reading the Bible, you know, really, you say, God, what do you want to say to me? What do I need to learn How do I need to change my thinking? What do I need to integrate? Okay? And you get it most directly when you read it from the Bible, not from your sermons, not from your Sunday school lessons. As important as those are, but those are just to train you to get into the Word yourself. Okay? And then when you pray, and you pray, you really know that He is there, and He is listening You know, people who go to the hospital and their spouses, their children, their friend is in a coma. And they still will talk to them. You know, 
because it's still meaningful. It's meaningful not only because they might hear, but it's meaningful because as you bring it out and you say it and you form the words, clarity about how you think, how you feel, clarity about your relationship. You see, it uh, becomes more real, more evident, and it grows. So these things work. And I'm just trying to explain how they work. And it's a great thing because when it's us just being the junior partners, who carries the heavy lifting? God. Yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Father, I just really do pray that as we have taken this very challenging passage, that you will speak to us, not just to our minds, not even including our imaginations, but you would indeed, as Paul prayed for the Ephesians, open our spiritual eyes so that we would not only understand, but we would see the conviction. And then, as we try to abide in faith and trust and obey, we'll find that we can grow, we can be strong, and we can be fruitful. I pray this as a wonderful blessing that I know you want to give to all of your people here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.